it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gustavo Gurin. Gustavo is a biologist by training. He obtained his bachelor degree from Universidade de São Paulo, here in São Paulo. Uh, then he got his uh, master's degree in botany from the same university and a PhD degree in ecology from the same university. Before moving uh, abroad, he was a postdoc researcher at USP as well. He is the person that I know that knows the most about vertebrates and plants in the same time, so it's amazing. Uh, currently, Gustavo is a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, in the UK, working the interface between macroecology and macroevolution. His interest in uh, how biological interactions, biotic and abi abiotic factors affect the diversification dynamics of different groups. As part of his research, he works on method development and performance testing, and he is a great enthusiast of open science. <laughs> so welcome, Gustavo, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Flavia. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, thanks uh, for the invitation. It's a lovely opportunity to talk a little bit about what I do, uh, especially in this context where I don't have to hide the math away and trying not to scare biologists, which is usually what I have to do. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having me. And today I will talk a little bit about what I have been doing through my career uh, and also try trying to show some of the quantitative aspects of my research and briefly talk about my future projects. So yeah, as Flavia already said, I have a bachelor's degree in biology and did my PhD and a first postdoc there uh, with Thiago Quintal at USP, uh, working with macroevolution. So in broadly, my research interests are always related to the diversification dynamics. So speciation and extinction, we will talk a little bit in detail about it in a minute. Uh, and also incorporating some aspects from ecological interactions and also interaction networks uh, in a macroevolutionary context, uh, context. But I also have this uh, particular interest about uh, the methods in macroevolution. So I really want to know what, what is going on behind the curtains uh, in the methods that we usually uh, use in macroevolution. So I have been digging into learning some of the details and testing their performance. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about this also today. Um, just a brief description of my current project here at the museum. I'm working with uh, other researchers and trying to understand a little bit about the body size evolution in marine mammals. We have our first paper uh, in review, almost accepted, so you will see some results from this uh, research quite soon. Um, okay, so I guess it's it's not new to anyone uh, to say that throughout the hundreds of millions of years of life on Earth, uh, biodiversity has changed quite a lot, uh, both in terms of the number of species, but also in terms of the relative diversity between uh, different groups that exist at the same time, and also uh, in relation to their form and shape uh, throughout those, those evolutionary timescales. Uh, in, in, Thinking about geological timescales, the present, the time we live in, our lifespan is just a snapshot in time. Uh, it's a very brief moment in comparison to the hundreds of millions of years of life on Earth. But it's possible to see uh, that these processes that act on these uh, millions of years have left imprints on how richness distribution patterns, for instance, can be similar or different from, from different groups. So for, uh, as, as an example, here we can see on the upper panel the, the diversity distribution of tetrapods and some different uh, reptile groups on the bottom panel. And the same can be also seen for birds, for instance, and for uh, mammals. But 
as I said, what we see today, it's only a snapshot of processes that have occurred and still occur in many different time scales. And what do I mean by different time scales? So these patterns can be simply a consequence of phenomena that happen in, for instance, early time scales, such as uh, the change of seasons uh, and the migratory uh, events that occur from as a consequence of these changes of seasons, as you can see in these two animations. On the right, you have the, the uh, a bird migration throughout the year that, uh, that are, occur in response to the changes in, in temperature and precipitation and all that comes with the change of seasons. But these patterns are usually uh, studied in ecological uh, studies because of the, the time scales they happen. But these different patterns in occupation throughout the planet can also be a result from patterns from, from processes that occur in much deeper time scales. Uh, for example, in this animation, we can see how the, the, the in the upper panel, we can see the geological changes that the planet has gone through uh, the last 550 million years since the Cambrian. And in the bottom panel, we can see how the marine diversity has changed due in part to changes in this geological uh, conformation of the, of the continents. Um, and, and these changes through time can either uh, promote or can hamper the diversification depending on the context, on the group and, uh, and on other factors as well. So um, this is quite interesting, at least for me. And in addition to these more continuous geological timescales, we also uh, saw that throughout history, we have some uh, episodes of massive events, like global events of biodiversity loss, for, for example, that are traditionally called uh, mass extinctions. For example, the ones that the one that happened between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene that ended the dinosaur era in on Earth, uh, but we have also other events of of mass extinction, and those ex those events they not only change the number of species that are uh, living at the same time on the planet, but also they change the relative composition of different groups and consequently also changes in, in the ecology and how ecosystems function. And in addition to that, not only geological factors uh, will act in those timescales, we also know that there are variation in climatic factors uh, in these timescales that might also influence how different groups uh, gain or lose species. For example, in this figure, we can see how uh, temperature changes in the upper left panel. And we can see that different vertebrate groups respond uh, differently to these changes in, uh, in temperature. So this is a very interesting question to understand how climate shape uh, the diversity we see from different groups in, in over these time scales. And lastly, but not least, also, not only abiotic factors will affect the diversification of groups, but also biological interactions are an important component uh, that will shape the diversity uh, of the interacting groups. So uh, it is quite a challenge to understand these complex histories because all those uh, factors are acting at the same time, even though they might not have uh, the, the same importance throughout the, the whole history of, of a group of a couple of different organisms. So uh, understanding which of the factors affect the most and at, it, at which moment these factors affect the diversification dynamics of groups is a, a very uh, big challenge, especially because we cannot run experiments in these time scales. So we have to rely on different types of data that might allow us to go back in time and try to understand what happened uh, millions of years ago. Uh, so therefore, my main, the main goals of my research, as I briefly mentioned in the beginning, is to try and assess the biotic and abiotic drivers of biodiversity change through geological timescales. 
And but how do we study these patterns? I showed you the patterns, but how do we make use of those patterns to try and understand uh, what happened uh, in the history of the life of a group? So in, in macroevolution, we basically have two distinct ways of trying to, to understand these changes in biodiversity in deep time. In one hand, uh, we have one type of studies, which is we, we usually call diversification studies, where we are interested in the dynamics of formation through speciation and the disappearance of species through processes of extinction. But not only this for me, the gain and uh, loss of species is interesting to us, but also how these species change in form, like how, because this is strictly related to how these species interact with the environment, not only the biotic environment, but also the abiotic uh, environment. And this can be linked to adaptive processes and many other types of processes. So uh, this is another way of understanding how diversity change, how biodiversity changed in, in macroevolutionary timescales. And also these two things can be analyzed together, not only the, the changes in number of species, but also in their uh, form and shape and ecology, as we will see in a bit. But as I mentioned repeatedly, this might look simple, but we have to think that those processes occur uh, in geological timescales, so millions of years, and we have no way to uh, make experiments uh, in those timescales for uh, obvious reasons. So what we need to, uh, to try and understand is some sort of time machine uh, to try and assess those processes in these timescales. And in macroevolution, we typically use two types of time machines, uh, which are actually two types of data that we call. And the first one uh, are the molecular phylogenies, which have been increasingly getting more importance in macroevolution because of the, the all the advances in, in molecular biology, sequencing, uh, each, each day more species are incorporated to these database, databases. So we have an increasing uh, availability of these uh, phylogenies. And these phylogenies, especially for vertebrates, they contain uh, information com coming from only uh, living species or at best ext uh, recently extinct. So such as like the Holocene, uh, the Pleistocene uh, fauna, for instance. Uh, and we use a couple of coalescent models and we by me i mean other people because i don't build the phylogenies i only use the phylogenies that other people uh, build but they not only can have their their relationships estimated but also we can estimate how long ago pairs of species uh, split separated from each other uh, and this uh it's a very important type of data because we can have a good understanding of the current biodiversity because we also have can associate this type of data to many different ecological information of the current species. Uh, this information can come from either direct observations that are tabled uh, and made available, uh, for instance, dietary information, but also we have uh, occurrence uh, information and many other types of uh, data that are collected either by scientists or by citizen scientists, uh, which help us understand uh, what, how the, the current state of biodiversity. Uh, and also we can make some inferences made from uh, ecological attributes. So there are an increasingly increasing effort in trying to scan many uh, species and have measurements taken. For instance, here is a, a hummingbird where we can take measurements from the beaks, different measurements that can correlate to different ecologies. And so working with current uh, living species is quite exciting because we can go to the field still for a while uh, and get new data and try to make better inferences. But there is a downside of working with molecular phylogenies which is due to the very nature of the data, we have data only from extant species. 
when we build those phylogenies, we don't have any direct information about extinction. So when we look uh, at a molecular phylogeny and we count the number of species that are alive at the same time through time, we see that there is only an increase in biodiversity. We never see any information, uh, any direct information about extinction. And this limits the extent of the, the questions we can answer using only this data and also leads to some methodological challenges that I won't go into detail uh, today. On the other hand, there is another type of data that we can use for macroevolutionary macro studies, which is the fossil record. Uh, the fossil record can be pretty cool for some of the groups, especially vertebrates. Um, and in terms of quantity and quality, it changes a lot, but uh, overall for vertebrates, we have good uh, quantity of uh, fossil information. And for some specific cases, for instance, this figure on the top right uh, part of the screen, we can have some pretty detailed uh, information. This is a, an example of an ichthyosaur uh, with a baby coming out of it. So it's amazing how much detail we can get uh, from the from the fossil record. And not only that, but the fossil record also has a very interesting advantage over the molecular phylogenies, which is through the fossil record, we can have direct access to extinction events because they will be preserved uh, until a certain point in time on the fossil record. And we can uh, properly assess uh, extinction information with greater accuracy. Um, so this kind of alleviates that problem we have from molecular phylogenies, but this is not to say that the fossil record doesn't have any problems because there are some issues with preservation, incompleteness, that also we have to come up with some solutions to try and address uh, these problems. So thinking about a range of availability of data, we can go from one, extra, one end on the left, which we have basically no fossil record, but plenty of uh, extant species information. And on the other extreme on the right, we have groups that are fully extinct, such as the dinosaurs or the trilobites. Uh, and ideally we would be in a situation right in the middle where we have good information on both the fossil and the living species, but there, are, there aren't that many groups that have uh, this, these features. So we have to find ways to deal with the limitations on the data uh, that are not in the ideal uh, situation. Okay, so what about the quantitative part? How, what do we do with the, if we have any type of data available, what do we do uh, in macroevolution in terms of the quantit quantitative aspects. Uh, I'm going briefly through the, some of the fundamentals of the methods we use in, in macroevolution. I will try and be succinct, uh, just to not scare too many people away. Uh, but one thing, like when I say, what about the quantitative part of macroevolution? I am sure that everybody thinks about a bus station, right? It's of course, it's natural to think about a bus station. <laughs> Just kidding. But I will explain why I brought this. So uh, I think everybody was in a situation at some point, like on a sunny Saturday, you want to just go to a bus station and stay there for a few hours, counting not only the number of buses that arrive in a given amount of time, but also how long it takes for one bus to arrive after the other one. Uh, so uh, we can count these two things, which are the, the number of arrivals per unit time and how long it takes for consecutive buses to arrive. And there is a very specific scenario where these two quantities can be modeled by the same parameter. So uh, the number of events per unit time, we usually can model as a Poisson distribution because it's a discrete, as a discrete variable. And the waiting times between two consecutive arrivals, we can then model them as exponential uh, distribution. 
And not coincidentally, these two, uh, these two distributions have the same parameter, which is lambda. And when these two distributions can be modeled by the very same parameter, we have what we call a Poisson process. Uh, this is the core of most of the birth death models. Uh, they are built upon this Poisson process, which model both the, the number of events and the waiting time between events, uh, not only for uh, in, in, in these situations as like a, a bus station, but also we can use this and make this analogy and go back to the to our interests. So thinking about the, the phylogeny or the fossil record, we can think of events of speciation and or extinction as the bus arrivals. So we can all count for, for example, we can count how many events of speciation occur uh, per million years, for instance, which is the most usually time frame we we, we deal with, uh, and the same uh, for extinction. And also we can use the, the, the time lag, the, the amount of time that it takes for uh, another event to happen after one event has happened already. So uh, this is the very basics of estimation uh, of the rates that we use in, in macroevolution, in speciation and extinction rates more specifically. And uh, Okay, so that's the, the idea, but how exactly do we do it? So now I'm gonna go through a bit of the step-by-step -step of a likelihood of a birth death model using a molecular phylogeny. Don't panic, I know you got this, but uh, please interrupt me if you have any questions, okay? So yeah, going back to the phylogenies, uh, these phylogenies, they will, as I said, not only uh, show us the relationship between different species or groups, but also they will show us how long ago they split from each other. Um, the problem of dealing with the full phylogeny at first is that each branch represents a lot of time. For instance, in this example, uh, some branches are up to 400, more than 400 million years. So, so many things can happen through, uh, through this time frame that we cannot use face value, uh, what is on in the phylogeny. But there are ways that we can do it by looking not at the full phylogeny, but trying to take a look into very short time scales because it's much easier for us to, to infer what could happen in shorter time scales, uh, rather than trying to come up with what happened throughout 600 millions of years of evolution. Um, and we can do this uh, multiple times. So going from the present and we can traverse the tree going towards the root and estimating what could ha what happened and what could have happened in, the, in each of these uh, short time, scale, time frames. If we do this repeat, uh, repeatedly until we reach the very end of the tree, we can then have a better sense of what could have happened uh, throughout the whole time frame of the, of the group, uh, accounting for all the possibilities. To do that, we use uh, an algorithm that is called a pruning algorithm which was proposed by Joe Felsenstein on the, in the 70s. And it, it consists in basically uh, two major steps. The first one is defining some initial conditions, which I will talk to you right now. And then, as I said, traverse the tree rootwards, considering all that can happen along the way. So breaking this into two steps, first we need to name what we call by initial conditions. In this case, we have this phylogeny, it's very simple phylogeny consisting of species A, B, and C. And since in this case, we are talking about a, a diversification analysis, so speciation and extinction, uh, we, the, the initial conditions for us will be to uh, define whether a species is alive or not. In this case, in the very beginning of the tree, uh, in the present is quite easy, see, right? Because if we see the species, it's because the species is alive. So for each of those uh, three species, we will define them as the, the probability of being at, uh, living is one and the probability of it being 
extinct is zero because we are observing uh, these, the, the, those species. And so we do this for all the species at the present. And we start doing what I just showed you, like taking small bits of time, walking step by step towards the, the, the root of the tree. And we have to consider the, the equation. The equation itself is not important. Uh, but in Gustav? sorry, yeah, uh, you were frozen for 15 seconds, maybe. Oh, Can you okay, go back what, the where did second? I yeah. stop? And this one, yeah, okay. So, you, you lost everything I said. Uh, we just listened the beginning. I think you can do it. Okay, I can, re I can go over again. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, yeah, breaking this algorithm, this pruning algorithm into two steps, basically we first, we, we have to do these two steps. The first step would be to name what we call initial conditions. Uh, in this case, it's a, a diversification model. So uh, this means that we are interested in the formation and disappearing of species. So the initial conditions in this case would be to classify each species that we are seeing in the phylogeny as being alive or being extinct. In this case, it's quite simple because if in the present, if we are seeing the species, of course, the species is still alive. So the probability of it being alive is one and the probability of it being dead is zero by definition. After we do that for all the species that are in the in the present and are present in the tree, we will start doing what I just showed you, like the taking small bits of time and uh, going step by step towards the root, considering everything that can happen uh, in each of these very short time steps. And what do I mean by all that can happen in those short time steps? Uh, since we are talking about the diversification uh, analysis, basically we have to account for what can happen in terms of speciation and what can happen in terms of extinction. In terms of speciation, basically we have to consider uh, the very obvious uh, situation where nothing happened. So the species only survived through this uh, small interval of time. But since we are start now going back to the past, we, we cannot ob directly observe what happened. So we have to infer what happened. And then we have to account for the probability of in that very short time period, uh, the lineage uh, suffered a process of speciation. So it generated a new species in this time interval, but one of them uh, went extinct. So we don't see it. Uh, nowadays, and that's why we only see one species today. And we have to multiply it by two because it, uh, we have to consider uh, each of those species that might be the result of the speciation process, either the one uh, being extinct or the second one being extinct. And talking about extinction, we can also account for all the extinction related processes that could have happened in this, in this time frame. Uh, which are the very extinction of the lineage, uh, we, which is the uh, red part. The green part is related to the probability of this lineage having survived this interval, but becoming extinct later. And also the probability of uh, in this small uh, time frame, there, there was a, a, a speciation event, but then both of the of the species went extinct. And so this is basically what we, we call by everything that can happen in a very short time scale. And then we can calculate these probabilities for each of those time scale time frames um, traversing throughout the tree and going uh, back to the root. But as I showed you before, we have uh, we can we we have to do this for each lineage, right? For each of the species that are present in our tree. But due to the nature of the tree, these these species will coalesce at some point. They will go back to their most recent common ancestor. 
And so what do we do when we reach a node? What do we do when we reach this point of the, where two, spe two sister species diverged from each other? Uh, what we do in this case is that we have to consider that we can see both the N and the M species nowadays in this, in this figure, right? Uh, so by, by saying that we see N and M, this end, uh, it's very important here, and in math, in math terms, what does it mean? It usually means a multiplication. So when we reach the, the node, what we do is it's multiply the probability of uh, the probabilities associated with the branch that leads to the species n, and multiply it by the probabilities that are related to the existence of uh, branch m. And then we have uh, the, the multiplication of these probabilities will become the new initial condition for that node. And then we repeat the process all the way back uh, to the root of the tree. Gustavo, and, uh, wait. Uh, th there is a question from Nicole. She's asking, okay. wh when you say a short time scale, what is short? Is it 1 million years, 1,000 years, yes. 1 year? That's <laughs> That's a good question. No, uh, we, we don't specify it usually. Uh, this is more of a mathematical trick. So uh, most of those, of those models will uh, kind of boil down to a differential equation. So this, uh, we try and make those, those time intervals as short as we can. But there, there aren't. Uh, there is a not a standard like a proper unit as that we use. Um, but there is this trade-off between uh, using a very very tiny interval, uh, which will give us more resolution, but uh, it will increase also the computational time and computation cost, or using a larger uh, time frame. Uh, at the expense of uh, losing detail, too much detail, too much resolution on time. Uh, most of those uh, those models, they typically, I would say, work on the on the range of like one uh, one thousand to ten thousand years. Um, but I would say that it's more commonly work, uh, it's more common to work on the scale of hundreds of thousands of years. She says thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so by doing that, we can do this repeatedly for all of the lineages and all of the branches in our phylogeny, and eventually we will reach the root. And when combining those, all this, these probabilities at the root, we will end up with this very beautiful ex, uh, expression. I don't want you to uh, understand everything about it, uh, but this is basically the likelihood function uh, in a very simple scenario where the rates don't change. We have, we've, we have all the living species present in our phylogeny, but I won't go into too much details. And this is the expression that will be optimized to try and find the values of both um, lambda and mu, which represents the speciation and the extinction rates uh, respectively. And our data is coming into this expression as these times, like the T with the indices. This is where the the, the timing between consecutive events will come into this expression and inform our model uh, in order for us to try and estimate which combination of parameters better explain the data that we are observing, which in this case uh, is the phylogeny. This is a very simple scenario, okay? But are you still alive? Is everything okay? Any questions? So. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, <laughs> the, the confusion uh, faces is, is, is very expressive. Uh, so okay. uh, I don't understand what is between brackets there. You have, you have a, uh, a product of, of K equals... Uh, so, so if you could please explain... Uh, uh, yeah, so this. as I said, like K is the... Uh, it's the number I... I don't remember exactly what is K is. Do you have a very good question? Um, I, yeah, I think 
n here is the number of species and k will be the number of branches if i'm not wrong but i would have to uh take a better look at it because now on the top of my mind i don't remember exactly what the k means i'm sorry is that the number of nodes uh gustav i it can be i think it's either the number of nodes or the number of branches uh yeah. which are related to each other so they actually mean the same thing yeah. um and by placing this equality inside uh in the middle of this expression you mean the the whole uh the, Oh, the whole term that I, succeeds I, it is is this product or or yeah i think this equality is just a matter of uh, formatting okay. uh, it's it's weird uh now that i noticed sorry for that <laughs> okay uh, yeah but this is like you can find a better a better version of this expression in uh, many papers uh but we can talk about it later uh yeah now i noticed it's a ve very weird I'm sorry for that. I just wanted to show you like a kind of a general expression for it. That's okay. I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, there, there are two actually from the same person, João. He's asking, oh, uh, this is pretty much a neutral model, right? What would a trait informed model uh, look like? I will talk about it in a second. Okay. So yeah, this is a neutral in terms of like this is kind of a trait agnostic model. It's, uh, it's basically the diversification dynamics of the group without having any other information other than the, the branch lengths and the branching times. But I will talk about uh, some of the ecological and trait information in a second. And the second question that he's making here is how would changing species lambda and mu rates influence this probabilities multiplications when lineages coalesce? Uh, no, yeah, so that the, the lambda and mu, it's exactly the values that we want to, uh, to estimate uh, that will maximize the probability of us observing the phylogeny we have under this very simple uh, birth-death model. Uh, there are many discussions nowadays because uh, in theory, these, these models have been shown to be un unidentifiable, these parameters. So we don't have any enough information from the phylogenies to properly estimate both of those rates at the same time. But this is too much for today. Uh, but we, you, you can write me an email later if you want more details. Um, awesome. Thanks, he says. Okay. Yeah. All right. So moving on. Yeah. Um, okay, so this, as I said, this is a very simple mo model where we assume that the, ch the rates don't change through time. So from the very beginning at the very, uh, until the present, uh, these diversification rates don't change. But this is a rather simple scenario, and it's very unlikely that the rates di didn't change throughout the whole history of a group. And so in the recent years, uh, some researchers started uh, kind of making those models a little bit more flexible. And one of the, the, new, the newest developments is to allow for those rates. Uh, oh, here the, the, the expression is better formatted. So now it makes more sense. Um, and and the, the idea of these new methods is to allow for those rates to, to change through time as well. So uh, this uh, makes more sense because it's very unlikely that the rates didn't change throughout many millions of years. Um, and so these integrals here, these cute integrals here, basically represent this idea uh, that, that rates can change through time. And, and why is this important? Because if we think on a, of a, a very simple scenario where speciation and extinction are constant, for a group to be seen as alive today, speciation has to be greater than extinction, because otherwise, if extinction was greater than speciation, most likely the, the whole group would be extinct by now. So usually, when thinking about constant rate birth death models, what we expect is a scenario of expansion of biodiversity uh, because of, of the, the very characteristic of these, these models. 
but it's very unlikely that all of the groups are going through uh, expansion scenarios. There are other scenarios that are very interesting to think, for instance, like the saturation scenario where the diversity of a group increases through time and reaches a peak. And even a more interesting scenario, more complex scenario where the diversity of a group reached a peak and then started declining. But as I said, we don't have direct information about the extinction in those phylogenies. So uh, by allowing the, 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 these rates to change through time, the, now these new models allow us to test for these last two scenarios, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to, to recover those scenarios using simple uh, constant rate birth death models. But to what extent actually these methods can indeed detect uh, these, these different dynamics um, in the, in, from molecular phylogenies? So one of my PhD, the, the, my PhD dissertation chapter was to actually use simulations to test how well these, these models can perform when trying to detect this scenario of decline in diversity. So what I did is I simulated um, many different trees. Uh, I simulated them in a decline scenario, such as the, the red curve there. But then I used a model selection approach and fitted four different models, one with both rates constant and a combination of, of constant and varying changes uh, through time to see how well those methods behave when trying to uh, infer decline of diversity from molecular phylogenies. Uh, and we, what we show is that those models can estimate the, these dynamics reasonably well with some, some uh, issues that I won't go into detail. Um, but it is interesting to see that these newest developments now allow us to test for more complex uh, diversification scenarios than a simple uh, constant rate birth death model. So uh, one other way of making those models more flexible is related to the question by João, which is incorporating some uh, ecological information to this, to this scenario. So now these models, which are called like trait dependent diversification models, not only we have to account for the dynamics specifically of speciation and extinction, but we also can map some of the some traits into the phylogeny. And we now have also to account for the dynamic of the trait itself. So uh, in, in, in a similar uh, way of thinking, in each of those, of those small time steps, not only we can think of whether this lineage uh, generated a new species or lost uh, a species, we can we have also to incorporate the idea that the, the, the trait itself can change. For instance, there is, a, a, I don't know, the presence or absence of a structure. It can, uh, we have to account for the dynamics of the, the, this presence and absence of a given trait. Uh, and this uh, class of models was is very is still very important, even though there are some limitations. Um, and it boils down to a, a couple differential equations. I won't go into much detail, uh, but now we these models they allow us to estimate speciation and extinction rates, but link it to the specific state of a trait. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I can illustrate with one of my chapters as well. So in my PhD, I was initially interested in assessing the effect of diet in the diversification. Uh, and by that, I mean speciation and extinction rates in birds. So what we've, what we've done is that we classified all 10,000 bird species into nine different dietary categories. Um, they, Based on dietary information, we can we could say that uh, not not all of those that are represented here became a, a category in my in my paper. But still, this is just to illustrate how different adaptations can lead to different uh, dietary ecologies. 
And using that, those models that allow us to estimate trait-dependent diversification rates, uh, I fitted those models to the whole bird phylogeny. And eventually what we found is that uh, most of the more specialized dietary guilds, they have a similar diversification dynamics with the exception of species that are considered omnivores, uh, species that have no uh, particular, uh, particular main dietary item in their diet. And not only that, not only they are different, but also we saw that in, in most cases, the, the net diversification rate, which is the difference between speciation and extinction rate is negative which means that this uh, these dietary guild would lose species to extinction more frequently than they would generate a new omnivore species. But if we go back to the bird phylogeny, uh, we see that currently we have over a thousand of omnivore species. So how can we reconcile uh, these two things? Like the, the, it's a guild that loses species more frequently than they gain species. But at the same time, the richness nowadays is really high. It's like 10% of all bird species are omnivores. And, and to, uh, to help us understand what happened, we have to take a look at the transition uh, dynamics, which is that new uh, thing, new feature of this model that we have to account, which is the change uh, in an interval of time between the states, the different states of the traits. So uh, these models estimate those transition rates. And what we found is that the, these transition rates are mainly towards becoming a omnivore. So uh, basically the current richness of omnivore species is maintained through the transition of uh, other dietary guilds into omnivory by adding uh, new food items. Uh, and have, just to wrap, yes. Uh, there's a, a quick question, I guess, from Erika. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question with the models that you add. Uh, uh, Trace information. Um, uh, what can you repeat because the, the, yes. the mic cuts. Um, yeah. I have a question with these models. When you add this trait information, which is a time mm -hmm. scale that you can trace back these traits. I don't know uh, if I find myself clear because for yeah, example, yeah. So we we have only the information for current species in this case, and when we travel back in time, we have to account for all possibilities. Uh, so we don't we don't actually try and reconstruct and estimate what the ancestral state was, but we in fact consider all possibilities of transitions and incorporate this into the likelihood uh, function to estimate those rates. So we are not actually estimating what the ancestral diet of birds was, for instance, uh, but we are using the current uh, information and accounting for all possible scenarios. Is this, does this answer the question? Yes, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Uh, but so, yeah, now to wrap up uh, about the, the topics about my dissertation, uh, my last chapter, I was in my last chapter, I was interested uh, in more of it's it's a similar rationale, but it's kind of in the opposite direction. So instead of thinking about how a particular thing, uh, how a particular aspect of the ecology of a species affected the diversification rate, I was now actually interested in how the diversification dynamics was related to the ecological function of species. Uh, and more specifically in this case, in, in the, the role that bird species played in seed dispersal networks. So uh, in, my last, in the last chapter of my, my PhD dissertation, I wanted to see if if those evolutionary processes, the diversification dynamics of those birds, and more specifically, what we call microevolutionary stability of those species, was somehow related to the position of those species into uh, species as seed dispersal networks. Um, 
to do that, we use a diversification uh, information that we estimated from the molecular phylogenies, from the whole bird phylogeny, uh, and also a collection of seed dispersal networks that were spread through the, the whole planet. And what we, using some mixed phylogenetic models that I also won't go into detail, what we found is that indeed there is a correlation and uh, the more the, the central species in those uh, ecological networks, in those seed dispersal networks, they tend to come from from lineages that are more stable through macroevolutionary timescales. And what do I mean by stable? In this case, uh, stability has basically comes from two different uh, things. The lineage can either have very low extinction rates, which mean that the probability of one species of that lineage going extinct is very low. So the lineage is present for a very long time. So it's stable in this sense. Or it can also be represented by lineages that have a very a, a much a, a speciation rates that are much higher than the extinction rate, rate would, which would mean that the, that lineage will accumulate lots of similar species into very short time scales and uh, making the, the whole lineage uh, stable because there is always one of the species of that uh, that lineage present at a given point in time. Um, yeah, okay. So this was basically the result of my, my PhD. And everything I said until now was related to diversification models, either trait dependent or independent. Uh, but as I said in the very beginning of the, the talk, um, there is other ways of analyzing how species, how biodiversity changes through time, which is through the analysis of uh, the phenotype of those species. So this is just an illustration of a paper that came out last week. It was the cover of science by some uh, colleagues here at the museum, where they analyzed the, the, the shape of uh, mama, mammal skulls. And you, we can see that even within mammals, which is just one group, there is quite a lot of variation. So it's quite interesting to see uh, how these things change through time. And to do that, we I won't go into too much details on these models as well, but there are particular type of types of models that we can use to estimate how those how the, the, the traits change through time. Either discrete traits, for instance, like the presence or absence of uh, a given structure, or the types of diet in birds, as I showed, or also uh, some quantitative um, variables, such as like body size or the size of a given structure. And to do that, we can use either Markov models for discrete characters or uh, Brownian motion or Stein-Ullenbeck models uh, and some other more complex models. And uh, the rationale behind using these uh, phenotypic evolution models is pretty similar to what we saw for the diversification analysis. But now instead of uh, uh, considering what can happen in terms of uh, speciation and extinction, we will uh, analyze what can happen in terms of changing phenotype through time. So uh, the, the algorithm is the same. We define the initial conditions. We go back in time, uh, considering the branch lengths. We combine the probabilities at the nodes we reach the root of the tree, and then we uh, optimize the likelihood function at the root of the tree to try and estimate the parameters that better explain our data. Uh, to illustrate one specific case of this type of study uh, is the, the most recent thing I have been working on, which is uh, trying to understand uh, body size evolution in cetaceans. And why cetaceans? Because cetaceans is one very interesting group to think about body size because we have species that range from the vaquita, which is a very tiny cetacean, highly endangered, that grows up to like one, 1 1.5 meter, to the blue whale, which is the largest animal ever to have lived in the surface of the earth, uh, which can range to like 30 meters long. So how what what drove this such a variation 
in uh, in this group. So here we have just this illustration to show how large those uh, species can can go and how small as well. And uh, in the current project, we also incorporated fossil information, which is not very uh, typical in these uh, in these studies. Uh, to do that, we used some phylogenetic imputation algorithms to uh, estimate the total body size based on some proxy measures, uh, basically skull measurements from, from fossil cetaceans. And we fitted uh, some continual straight evolution models. And what we found is that uh, the adaptive landscape of body size for cetaceans is remarkably flat, uh, with the exception of very few shifts, one, uh, the number two on the upper left part, which represents the, the recolonization of the marine environment. Uh, and also the number eight, which shows like the, the current uh, porpoises and dolphins, which are much smaller than uh, most of other cetaceans. Apart from that, there aren't many changes, many drastic changes especially what we would expect for the large species, such as the, the fin whale, the blue whale. Uh, but we also can see that there are some trends, some small trends going on. So it's basically the, the whole process of body size evolution in this group is a mixture of very few drastic shifts towards different body sizes uh, associated to some smaller, more uh, gradual changes. And thinking about a representation of an adaptive landscape that we usually think about peaks and valleys, uh, what we actually propose is that the adaptive landscape for uh, the body size evolution in cetacean is more akin to uh, the turbulent waters in an ocean where we can see some peaks that might change through time. And also we can see those ripples uh, in the surface of the ocean, with, with, which would represent sub uh, local optima that are constantly changing and driving this more gradual um, evolution of body size. All right, so how much time do I have left? Uh, uh, three minutes, but you okay. have many minutes for questions so if you need more it's not a problem yeah i think i will need not like maybe five more minutes is, is that okay yeah perfect I, I can go pretty quickly so yeah i just wanted to show uh this is what i have currently been working uh the body size evolution in cetaceans but now i also am applying for uh other positions for the future and i wanted to show you quickly what the idea is um so in macroevolution, we are basically, uh, especially when com uh, coming from the fossil record, we are constantly dealing with processes that occur over time. So uh, we can translate this into time series, uh, not only of diversity, but also morphology and environmental variables. Uh, so here in this uh, cartoon figure, we can see, for instance, the two diversity curves, one for the orange species and one for the green species. Uh, so we can see that the, the number of species in those two groups, they change through time. Uh, and also there is a climatic variable that also changes through time. And we can, we ha having those three um, time series, we can start guessing what, uh, what is going on for these groups. For instance, taking a look at the number of species for those two groups, uh, we can see that around 20 million years, something happened, right? Because then the green group started decreasing in diversity, whereas the green, sorry, the orange group started decreasing, whereas the green group started increasing in diversity. And also we can see some discrete change into the climatic variable. So this makes us uh, kind of ask, what happened here? Is something that drove the orange group to extinction, which freed some ecological opportunity for the green speed for the green group to increase in diversity, or is it the other way around? For instance, the the increase something made the green group increase in diversity, which led the the orange group to decrease. 
And how is the climatic variable related to that? So until today, most of the most of the studies would try and address this type of questions using correlations. Uh, but I was never fully satisfied with those uh, with those approaches. And recently, I discovered this new approach, this rather new approach, which is called empirical dynamic modeling. And this will be the basis of my, my proposal. I will use this video just to illustrate a little bit because Robert May will explain this in much better detail than I can. So can you hear the, the, the sound? Not the sound, we can see the figure. The, the sound is not working? No. Uh, okay, so I can try and, and, and explain. So uh, this is a Lorenz attractor, which will represent the, the state space for uh, three different variables. And we can think of being like uh, rabbit, foxes, and grasses. And um, what this is uh, what this figure is representing is the, the the state in different moments in time of the system composed by those three uh but those three components and one interesting thing is that depending on the value of x for uh, of of z for instance uh the relationship between x and z can be positive or negative and when we look at these dynamics through time uh, we can also we can actually see that those are that they represent the a time series of the of each variable. Uh, in this case, uh, the three variables can go together. Uh, and ultimately, what I want to do is the reverse process. So uh, I can draw on the mathematics part of these uh, of these systems. And instead of going from the state space to the time series, is what I can do. Or what I want to do is this is what is showing now. So taking the time series and reconstructing the the state space for the system. And um, by this, uh, there are some mathematical technicalities that I I won't go into detail, especially because I'm still not completely comfortable with the math behind it. Uh, but there are theorems that show that, oh, sorry, that show uh, that by if, if the system obeys a, a certain number of conditions, uh, this approach allows us to test for proper causal relationships. <laughs> so instead of uh, testing for correlations between those curves, we can actually test for which change is what the change if the change in one curve is causing the change in other curve so we can properly address and see and test for those scenarios that i sh uh, that i said before we can test if it's the the decrease in the orange that is causing the increase uh in the green or if it's the increase in the green that is causing the decrease of the orange or is it a, a, an external factor for, for example, the climatic variable that is a common cause affecting uh, the dynamics of the two groups? So uh, my idea is to use this approach and take uh, information from published studies and from new estimations of diversity change through time and apply those methods, uh, <coughs> this approach to properly address uh, causal relationships between uh, different the, the dynamics of different groups. Uh, I was really excited about this uh, this proposal because I thought it was novel, even though I thought it was a bit too obvious for someone haven't tried it yet. Uh, but this week I found out that someone indeed tried using it, uh, which is a bit frustrating. But at the same time, it shows that the idea is worth pursuing. So my idea would be to apply this now for some vertebrate uh, systems. Um, well, that's what I had to say today. I hope I could transmit a little bit of the details. It's hard to find the balance between how much detail to go into and how much uh, biology to put. 
please let me know if you have any questions. I thank again the organizers for the invitations and I would gladly take any questions you have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gustavo. Um, there are some questions coming from the chat and I'll try to uh, tell them when they came from. Um, <laughs> so, João was asking, when you were um, talking about the change towards omnivory in birds, he asked, mm -hmm. are these rates of change uh, uh, are these rates of change your results? Or were they fed into the model? No, no, they are uh, they are estimated as well. So in this case, uh, the model that I fit to the data, th that's a good thing of, about working with the full bird phylogeny that we have much data to, to feed uh, to the model. So in this case, my my model, including for including the, the hyper prior parameters, I would say it had like 102 parameters most of those parameters were the transition rates. So they are also estimated. They are not fed into the model. So they are a result of the analysis. Okay, great. And his second uh, question before we start the questions here was uh, when you were talking about the memo school shape diversity, uh, how was mm -hmm. shape measured uh, morphogeometrically? How, how do you measure this? Yeah, in this case, in the particular paper by, by Anjali here, they use morpho uh, geometric morphometric techniques. Uh, they uh, mostly rely on, on 3D scanning, surface scanning for, uh, and, and placing some landmarks and pseudo landmarks, and then measure the distance between the, the, the landmarks and the pseudo landmarks to reconstruct uh, the shape. And then they, kind of like procrustes analysis and it's like a whole field of of research but yeah in this case they use basically the the principal components of a procrustes analysis okay great are there questions from the public here yes so they are going to pass the uh okay. microphone Gustavo, thank you so much for your lecture. I really, really liked it. Uh, my first question is about the uh, last work that you were showing, the, the one before the last, about the uh, aquatic animals. And did you mm -hmm. measure the body size only? Like, was a linear measurement to do the comparative analysis? Yeah, so in this case, uh, what we've done is we it's a combination of different ways of uh, assessing this information. So the first one is through the literature. So uh, my, my collaborator, Travis Park, uh, he compiled the data set by going to the literature and getting uh, proper measurements of like stranded uh, specimens and uh, other museum specimens that were preserved, uh, the whole specimen. And also what we've done is uh, taking some proxy measurements. So uh, he went into the collection here in the museum specifically, uh, but also in other collections. And he had access to many skulls from uh, from from specimens in the museum, both from living species and from extinct species, and he took many different measurements uh, from those skulls. And through the, there are basically two ways of estimating the the total length. In our case, we use a phylogenetic informed way, which is called this phylogenetic imputation, uh, where we use those uh, not only these skull measurements, but also some phylogenetic information to estimate the, the, the body size of these, these species that we don't have direct measurements uh, of total length. And uh, did you try it using other measurements or maybe other, I don't know, checking not only the body size, but other traits? 
No, in this case, we only use it, uh, and, and by body size here, we use total length. So that, that was the only, the only measurement we took. Uh, cetaceans are a bit tricky to, to deal with because they are so massive that it's hard to get mm -hmm. more information in terms of shape and size and these kind of things. So the, the total length, uh, not only it's a simpler uh, measure variable to, to get hold, but also it's, it's been shown that it's related to many aspects of the ecology of, of those species. So that's why we decided to stick with, uh, with the body size in this case. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another question. You said that the, well, during the comparative analysis that the adaptive landscape was flat and I don't know, could you explain a little bit more of what that means? Yeah. So uh, it, I think uh, it is a bit debatable. There are people that don't agree with this, uh, but the adaptive landscape is basically the relationship between any any trait that you want to uh, to assess and the the fitness of of that trait. So uh, here it's on the bottom uh, beside. I don't I don't think you can see my my mouse right. Uh, on the bottom of the panel C, we, there we is see. a phylogeny. You, we can see? Okay. Yeah, yes. Uh, so here you have like a kind of a, a representation of this adaptive landscape. So you have on the X axis, you have the, the, the body size uh, going from like small body sizes on this size and large body sizes here. And there are particular values of body size that uh, increase fitness uh, for the species. Uh, in this case, it's a bit of an extrapolation because usually the adaptive landscape is, is thought for much uh, shorter and smaller time and spatial scales. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to think that over evolutionary time scales that we can see also that are uh, specific values of body size that are uh, kind of, they, they provide some sort of uh, increasing fitness. So for instance, we have all the, 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 the very large whales, such as the blue whale, for example. Uh, this very large size is beneficial because it allows it for bulk feeding. So that, that way of feeding that where they can engulf a huge amount of plankton uh, and this uh, might have been an advantage uh, over uh, evolutionary timescales, such as that, that we, we see other uh, large species as well. On the other hand, uh, thinking about dolphins, for instance, they went to a, a, a different part of the body size uh, space, which is more related to being more agile, so they can pursue and, and capture their prey with greater agility. Uh, so this also, be, be, by, by having this type of ecology being small, it's much more advantageous because it's much better for you to increase in speed and, and maneuverability. Uh, so what we would expect is that because we have such extreme values in the group, uh, we, we, we were expecting to see many different peaks. So uh, uh, one peak for the very large species, one peaks for intermediate species as well. Uh, but what we actually see is not that. We see the, the uh, one peak for the small species, one peak that doesn't comprise the largest of all species, but may, ba basically what we see is that uh, there's a huge, uh, a single peak for a huge amount of, of species. Uh, so that's why we call it a little flatter because also the one of the parameters that we estimate is related to the selection strength. And when we look at those parameters, the selection strength for body size is not very strong. So, which means that there aren't much, there isn't much, uh, evolutionary pressure in changing body size over the time uh, for this group. So what we see is actually, instead of seeing like a very peaky uh, increase in fitness, what we see is that a more, much more flatter uh, surface here, wh which means that changing body size doesn't affect 
fitness as much as we would expect. Is this a bit clearer now? Yes, it's uh, clear now. I have one last question that is more technical. Uh, yeah. When you talk about the birds and the omnivorous, you showed us a plot where it showed the net diversification rate. Yeah. And I didn't uh, comprehend what was in the y plot, the y axis, the posterior density. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a technical detail. These models, they were initially thought to be implemented in a maximum likelihood uh, framework. But one thing that I always try to incorporate in my research is the phylogenetic uncertainty, because uh, after all, all phylogenies are hypotheses. We will never know which, uh, which is the true evolutionary history. So to, in order to incorporate this uh, phylogenetic uncertainty, I kind of ported these models from a maximum likelihood, uh, maximum likelihood uh, framework into a Bayesian framework where I could uh, fit the model to many different topologies. And uh, this is uh, the, the height of the peaks here is the posterior, it's density because it's in, in here, it, the, the net diversification rate is a continuous variable. But this basically shows the probability of each value associated uh, in, in the x-axis. So um, yeah, this, this is basically shows that the, the peaks here are the most likely value to be the true value for the parameter. So in this case, uh, let's say for um, nectarivores, the most likely value for net diversification rate is something around like 0 0.15 or something like that. And the same goes to all other uh, guilds. And uh, just a quick reminder uh, that not net diversification rate is the difference between speciation and extinction rate. So it's how many species each guild accumulates over time. Okay. And the herbivores, they have, uh, sorry. A huge variation, right? It's yeah. They have uh, this can be explained by basically two features. One is that there aren't that many herbivore species, so it's much harder to properly estimate uh, the rates for this guild. Uh, and the other one is that they are also quite sparse in the tree, so this also become makes it more. It's harder to to estimate and this as a result uh, becomes a larger uncertainty on the true value of the parameter. Thank you again for the answers and the lecture. You're welcome. There's another question. Hello, Gustavo. Uh, thank you hey. for the lecture. Mm, congratulations for your work. Very amazing. Uh, I have a question. Maybe it's a kind of topic because you already told us that you are not expert in doing the phylogenies. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was interested in the phylogeny of the cetaceans because you have mm -hmm. a lot of fossil data. And yeah. I would like to ask if you know how people uh, infer those phylogenies <laughs> if they combine different kinds of data, morphological and DNA data. How do they do mm -hmm. it? Yeah, so in this case, uh, we are using the phylogeny that was published early last year, or no, early this year. Uh, I lost track of time, sorry. Uh, we, uh, and they, they use an, a new approach, a rather new approach, which is called a meta tree, okay. which uh, it's an approach that aims at combining both morphological characters and molecular characters in the same analysis. I don't know the details of how it works. Uh, I know that more or less what the approach does is using the molecular phylogeny as a backbone and then incorporates the morphological uh, aspect of it into, as a kind of a super tree approach. Um, but I, I can't say much more than that. I know that for for the fossils, we don't have molecular data available, so they only enter in uh, in the part in the morphological part. Um, but 
yeah if you want i can uh, if you want to know a little bit more about it i can send you the the paper where they describe the the phylogeny and how they built it that would be very very nice thank you and yeah uh, please send me an email to remind me okay i will <laughs> i will uh, a second question that i have okay oh the mic went off yeah uh, yeah you during your your PhD, you were work, working mm -hmm. with, but uh, you were working with the, the birds phylogenies, and yeah. uh, if I understood, it was just molecular phylogenies, no fossil yes. data. And now no. you are working with fossil data and, and molecular data in this with these phylogenies of dissertations. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask you how. Uh, n now that have went to these two types of phylogenies and data, uh, which, as mm -hmm. you said, is not possible for all groups because some groups have a better fossil record than others. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you do you see that this new information of the fossil uh, impacts all those estimates that people do about diversification and speciation? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a thing that uh, sometimes makes me sad <laughs> because there are some groups that <laughs> perhaps you will never have this kind of information. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very good question. Thank you for that. Uh, it is interesting to see how much more uh, we can, how much more information we can assess by including the fossils in our analysis. Uh, I am, in, in, this, in this case, I use it, uh, the, this phylogeny only for morphological evolution. Uh, so I cannot say much about how this would impact on the diversification analysis, which is the, the following project we are working now. Uh, but I'm very interested because uh, macroevolution is especially the one, uh, the part that uses molecular phylogeny is fairly new area. Uh, so there's lots of new methods coming up uh, every year. And in, back into 2020, uh, there was a paper that basically threw all methods to the garbage because uh, they mathematically proved that what I said, that uh, from molecular phylogenies, you cannot estimate uh, speciation and extinction at the same time because those, those parameters are unidentifiable. So... For sure, at least for that, the inclusion of fossils will help us because now we will have uh, we will add information in terms of extinction dynamics, which we didn't have before, and we have to indirectly estimate using the the molecular phylogenies. Still, it's not as good as the proper fossil record with the occurrences and and all the the particularities of the fossil record. But I think it's one step towards integrating these these two types of data. Uh, one thing that is also nice was that our uh, supplemental analysis for this paper we showed that the major major patterns that we see they are not much affected by the inclusion of fossils. So, which is kind of encouraging to show that we are not we are missing, of course, part of the history. But if the event was drastic enough, we can still capture those, those events uh, in different types of phylogenies. So I think it's, we are progressing quite uh, in the, to, towards a very nice future. Uh, there's still a lot to do, but definitely uh, I think all of the major breakthroughs will come by integrating those data and not using either phylogenies or the fossil record, but using phylogenies that comp uh, are composed by extinct and extant lineages. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Do we have any other question from Zoom people or from here? No? There is one coming. <laughs> Passing the mic. Uh, hello, Gustavo. Thank you for the lecture. Hey. It was really good. And you were when you were answering um, Isabel, we were talking about 
how you went from the maximum likelihood to based on the statistics to include the mm -hmm. uncertainty about the phylogenies. Could you talk a little bit more about this part of your work? Yeah, so um, I am still learning a lot about uh, the, the specifics of Bayesian analysis. Uh, but for me, it makes perfect sense to, to go uh, towards this type of approaches because I, I don't like those papers that come up with a lot of certainty about what they are claiming because I, uh, we are reconstructing a process that happened uh, over this very long time scale. So I think we have more uncertainties that, that, than certain case. Uh, um, and this is more conceptual, thing. but think about more mathematical. I could. Uh, Gustav. Oi, Eddie. <laughs> I'm panicking now. What is happening? <laughs> I think he's not here, right? No. Let's see. <laughs> Let me see. Ah, uh, he said that he he felt <laughs> his internet is down and he's coming back. You're muted. Uh, I'm back. Yeah, something happened here. <laughs> you will realize. Um, I think yeah. you you need to begin again. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the I, I from a pragmatic point uh, standpoint, I think the Bayesian uh, analysis allow us to incorporate these many sources of uncertainty in a more in a much more natural way, uh, because the way the things are modeled, uh, I I think it's it is interesting that you can input some prior knowledge to your uh, to your analysis, and um, it is a challenge as well because. Uh, the machinery of, of the, the Bayesian implementation of these models is not uh, that easy to implement. Uh, but I think either way, either from like maximum likelihood or Bayesian uh, frameworks, those two approaches, in my view, are the, one, the ones that can be applied to macroevolution because I... I always see some papers that try to use comparative methods and still report like p values and r squared and this kind of stuff, which for me is really weird because those those uh, statistics they come from a a, a, conce a concept that you can if you can repeat that process an infinite number of times in five percent of the times you will expect that, that something happened, and you cannot do that with evolution. So uh, for me, it's much, much more natural to go to a maximum likelihood and a Bayesian approach rather than use a frequentist approach. Um, but I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's just, it feels more natural to me because then you don't have to make so many assumptions uh, from your data. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, she uh, thank you, Gustavo. Yeah, you're welcome. Did you listen? She said thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I think that's it. Let me check if there are any questions. There's no questions from the chat. And I think that's it, right? 
Okay, uh, yeah. If anyone has any questions later on, you can contact me through email or Twitter or check my website or any form of contacting me. It's valid. <laughs> and there is one more question because they really like to make questions in the very last minute. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, I, because I thought during the lecture, then I forget and then now, now I remember again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, it's okay. Those are the, you, you showed us those approaches, and, and especially in the case of Cetacea. Uh, uh, but uh, two other groups, uh, thinking of, of the sadness Thales uh, talked about regarding uh, when the fossil register uh, isn't, isn't so clear. Uh, in, in the case of plants, is there any chance of doing something similar? Yeah, plants are tough because... <laughs> uh, Plants are in a different, in this, a, a very particular position because like you have some uh, molecular information, but most of the phylogenies for plants are very unresolved. So you are not very sure about the, the specific relationships and the, the, the divergence times. Uh, and also the, the plant fossil record is also much more... Uh, it, the, the, the properties of the plant fossil record is a bit different from vertebrates, for instance, uh, in the sense of you have, when you have a fossil plant, usually you can assess much, uh, many different uh, features like in morphology, uh, morphological characters uh, to place that, that specific fossil into like the, a family or a genus or something like that. Uh, but you don't usually have a good fossil record in terms of like number of repeated uh, occurrences. Also, it is hard to identify those fossils because usually uh, you have uh, leaves being preserved or the stem being preserved, which are not very diagnostic characters. So um, it is it's much the, the identification of those fossils is much uh, rougher than for for vertebrates for instance so i think uh by the day the molecular information on plants is becoming better and better so i think in the near future we will see many good phylogenies coming out uh, and the fossils can add some information but uh, it is a bit outside of my area, so I would have to research a little bit more to take a look at how, how much better the inferences would be with the plant fossil record that we can find. I, I see. It is, it is troublesome, as I thought it would be. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For instance, the, 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 my, my last paper with the networks, I really wanted to try and uh, implement the same approach from the plant side. But uh, the, as I said, the molecular phylogenies for plants are much worse than the ones for birds. And also most of those uh, seed dispersal networks, they are built by animal ecologists. So they go into the field and they record the bird species that are visiting the plants, but they don't care too much. Uh, they, uh, sorry, they don't care as much uh, for the plant identification. So uh, I usually joke that on the bird side, you have even uh, the particular names of birds like John or James or something like that because of how well they are identified. But on the plant side, it's not rare for you to see like uh, Fabaceae or Myrtaceae, which narrows it down to a couple of thousands of species, you know? So um it that the, there are some limitations on the data, which is very frustrating. Okay, I see. Thank you, Gustavo. You're welcome. Um, thank you so much, Ari. Uh, Gustavo, sorry, I call him Ari. <laughs> like pizza, I cannot call him Fernando. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, uh, you're Dr. welcome. Gustavo. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you here. I think you. You presented something that we didn't see a lot during the course, so it was very uh, special. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm glad you liked it. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, gente. Ciao.